from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all and welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors around the world. I am your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead and I don't feel so well myself. And today, we're going to talk about the good old Statue of Liberty. It's a sculpture as familiar to all of us as Michelangelo's David. That's probably more familiar to some of us, even, as I remember learning about the Statue of Liberty as an eight-year-old kid in elementary school. But I don't recall learning about the David until much later. I can't speak for other nationalities, but growing up in America, everyone is introduced to the Statue of Liberty at a very early age. Schools and parents use the statue as a teaching tool. It's a symbol, we are told, of one of the founding principles of the United States, liberty. We are taught that the statue represents everything our country stands for, and that it was the first welcoming sight for millions of immigrants coming from Europe by boat, and that it is a beacon of freedom shining out over New York Harbor to the rest of the world. Many of us can probably recite from memory at least a few lines of the poem inscribed on the statue's base, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. In America, the Statue of Liberty is every child's introduction to the concepts of our national identity as a nation of immigrants, to shared ideals of freedom, and to the doctrine of American exceptionalism. After all, no one else has the Statue of Liberty. America has it, because America is special, a place like no other on earth where anyone can achieve their dreams, a land of equal opportunity, where the child of an immigrant could one day become President of the United States. The Statue of Liberty is the icon of the nation and of all the ideals the nation holds dear. Now, of course, it goes without saying that at no time in history has America fully lived up to these ideals, but I'm not going to open that can of worms. But because we learn about the Statue of Liberty at such a young age, we tend to take the statue for granted when we get older. At such a young age, we don't think to ask the most basic questions about its existence. And when we are older, we are no longer as curious about it as we might otherwise be. Ask an American, any American, what they know about the statue and its history and its meaning, and they'll come back at you with the same couple of facts, which are actually quite nicely summed up by the official website for the Statue of Liberty. It says, The Statue of Liberty, enlightening the world, was a gift of friendship, from the people of France to the United States, and is recognized as a universal symbol of freedom and democracy. The Statue of Liberty was dedicated on October 28, 1886, and the statue commemorates the alliance of France and the United States during the American Revolution. Right? Most Americans know more or less that. End of story, right? But stop and think about this gift from France for a second. I mean, this gift... It was the largest metal statue ever made up to that point. It took years to make, and it cost a fortune. Doesn't that sound just a little over the top as a gift to mark the 100th anniversary of the 4th of July? Whose idea was this? Who in France woke up one day and said, Hey, you know what we should do? We should do something nice for America's birthday. I know, we should spend years building the largest freestanding statue the world has ever seen. I mean, why did France go through this incredible, almost unbelievable effort and expense just to commemorate an alliance in a previous century? Did any other country do this for the United States? And if not, why did France? Did America do anything for France in return? Whose idea was it? Who paid for it? So today we're going to move past the second grade in our history of the Statue of Liberty and learn the grown-up version of events, not just the what, where, and when, but the why and the how. In researching this episode, I learned a ton I didn't know before, and my conception of the Statue of Liberty is very different than it was a few weeks ago. I've always respected the statue for its sheer size as a feat of engineering, if nothing else, but my appreciation is much deeper now. The history of the creation of the statue is reflective not only of the ideals the statue is purported to convey, but also of the ways in which people, not just Americans, but people in general, sometimes fail to live up to those ideals. So the story of the Statue of Liberty begins with the same events which influenced most sculpture in the 19th century in America, the Civil War. From 1861 to 1865, the United States of America, of course, 
were divided between North and South, waging a war over the question of slavery and the power of states versus the power of the United States federal government. The very union of the states under the federal government was at stake, but so was the very idea of what America represented to the world, a free nation governed by its people, held together by shared ideals which spring directly from the Age of Enlightenment. The Civil War was a referendum on the American experiment, and as the war rolled on, the world watched. One of those watching with intense interest was a Frenchman by the name of Edward Laboulaye. Now, Laboulaye was a lawyer, a politician, and an author, a political thinker, and a theorist who greatly admired the United States and, in fact, was an expert on the U.S. Constitution. He had published a three-volume history of the United States in France, and had translated the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin to French, and he also was a fervent abolitionist. When the American Civil War ended, Laboulaye formed and became president of the French Emancipation Committee, which was an organization which provided French aid to newly freed slaves in the United States. And part of the reason for this intense interest in the United States generally was that Laboulaye had an intense interest in France and he regarded the United States and France as closely fraternal. Both had undergone revolutions in the late 18th century, both fighting against repressive monarchies in the name of democracy and Enlightenment ideals. And now, in 1865, idealists like Laboulaye were inspired and encouraged as the Union Army and the Northern States declared victory, assuring the continuation of the Union. But France, in Laboulaye's opinion, was not doing nearly so well. France in 1865 was once again under the rule of a monarch in the form of Emperor Louis Napoleon III. Now, I've mentioned the general climate of the Second Empire in France in some other podcasts, remarking that the reign of Napoleon III was a time of decadence and frivolity, which is true. But the monarchy also was a deeply repressive and authoritarian regime. After the French Revolution, the two attempts that France made at representative government, now known as the First and Second Republics, had been short-lived, replaced with the rule of Napoleon Bonaparte as emperor, who was overthrown in 1815, and later with the Bourbon Restoration in 1830 and the dynasty of the Bonaparte family put into place. Napoleon III had it relatively easy for a while, as France's economy was healthy, and so people found it hard to be discontent enough to affect another revolution. But there was a strong liberal counter-movement against the monarchy in France, which found the example of the United States compelling and heartening. Liberal elements in French society and politics desperately wanted the American experiment to succeed, as success overseas could encourage change at home in France. Laboulaye and many others around the world rejoiced at the news that the Civil War had ended in triumph and were equally devastated at the news, coming only a week later, that Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. An outpouring of goodwill and solidarity for the United States pervaded French sentiments, and such was the mood at a dinner party Laboulaye gave in 1865 when, after dinner, in conversation with his dinner guests, Laboulaye suggested that funds be collected for a gift to the United States which would symbolize and strengthen the special bond France felt for the United States, a gift that would encapsulate the alliance between the two nations and serve to strengthen it, a monument to the ideals the two nations shared and cherished. It was an idea casually proposed, although one dinner guest in particular never forgot the idea, and it captured his imagination the young and promising sculptor Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, then 31 years old, immediately saw Laboulaye's suggestion as an excellent opportunity to create a sculptural monument of colossal proportions. He didn't act on this idea immediately, but it stewed in the back of his mind for years. Frédéric Bartholdi had always been ambitious, and he had had colossal sculpture on his mind well before that dinner party back in 1865. Born in 1834 in Colmar in the region of Alsace, France, very close to the Prussian border, Bartholdi had attended the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris for first painting and then sculpture, studying under Antoine Ette. But he also studied architecture under Violette Leduc. His early career as a sculptor was fairly typical, 
He entered work into the Paris Salon, and his hometown of Colmar commissioned him to make a monument to a local hero who had served as one of Napoleon's generals and had distinguished himself in Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. In 1855 and 1856, in his early 20s, Bartholdi took a trip with several fellow artists and ex-students from the Ecole to tour Egypt and Yemen, ostensibly for inspiration for his statue of Jean Rapp. One of his traveling companions was the painter Jean-Léon Jérôme, whose work would take a new turn because of this trip to Egypt, inaugurating the style or genre known as Orientalism in painting, which depicted Arab and Middle Eastern scenes and religions, which were seen as quite exotic back in France. Anyway, what Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi encountered on this Egyptian tour would influence his own work and interests, especially as concerns colossal sculpture. The Sphinx in the Valley of the Kings, the seated Colossi in Luxor and Memnon, and the ruins of many others sparked Bartholdi's imagination. The stone Colossi he encountered were made of sandstone blocks, assembled like a wall or a tower or any other masonry structure, and then carved into statuary. This, of course, was very different from the sculptural traditions he had learned in France of marble work carved from a single piece or clay models cast into bronze, and the relative ease in which one could achieve work on a huge scale by stacking and carving blocks of stone appealed to him. But as a trained architect, he was also aware of how the architecture of his time was undergoing a bit of a revolution with the introduction of steel beams and metal supports within structural walls, which gave newfound strength and versatility to traditional masonry buildings. And Bartoli realized that colossal sculpture, too, might be made using similar new techniques and materials. During the beginnings of his career, back in France, where he mainly made patriotic monuments commissioned by local governments to commemorate famous men and notable battles, it would appear that while Bartoli had no opportunity to create colossal work, the challenge of building one was of enduring interest to him. And ten years after his first trip to Egypt, Bartoli returned a trip which coincided with the completion of the Suez Canal, the enormous waterway which was constructed to connect shipping lines from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, was completed in 1869, and apparently Bartholdi had hatched plans to create a lighthouse in the form of an enormous statue for the entrance of the Suez Canal. Now, despite his connections and his nationality, because you see the Suez Canal was under French authority at the time, the proposal was rejected ultimately. But it's worth noting that the design for this lighthouse sculpture was of a colossal woman draped in neoclassical style, holding aloft a torch. Now, with his return to France and his proposal rejected, Bartholdi's career might have continued down its solid but unremarkable path were it not for the events of 1870, the year after the Suez Project fell apart. In 1870, France declared war on the Kingdom of Prussia, whom the French feared were shifting Europe's balance of power by its efforts to unite several smaller Germanic kingdoms into a German empire. Now, this move to attack Prussia by Napoleon III completely backfired, and France was quickly invaded by Prussia, and Napoleon III himself was captured. A new republic was quickly voted in, in the absence of the French emperor, and the war continued under a new French leadership, but with no better results. Within months, Prussian forces had laid siege to Paris. To make matters worse, revolutionaries in Paris, known as the Paris Commune, sparked a civil war against French forces within the city of Paris itself. At the same time, it was under siege by the Prussians. In a nutshell, disaster and chaos. These events changed the course of many sculptors' lives, notably Jules Delu, who fled from France to London, where he remained in exile for ten years, and whose presence there would deeply affect English Victorian sculpture in the following decades. And it affected the fortunes of Bartholdi no less. Bartholdi served in the French army, defending his native Colmar, unsuccessfully, but the real blow came when the war was over. The treaty which ended the war ceded control of the Alsace region, which included Bartholdi's hometown of Colmar, to Prussia. Bartholdi's patriotic fervor stirred by the devastating loss of his childhood homeland to Prussia, coupled, it must be said, with his abilities of self-promotion, put him in a very strong position to be chosen as the sculptor for a monument soon after the war ended. The monument was to go to the city of Belfort, 
a French town which had withstood a Prussian siege against enormous odds. It was one of the few victories on the French side of the Franco-Prussian War, and for Bartoli, commemoration of the event seemed to be a personal mission as well as professional. And Bartoli chose to commemorate the siege of Belfort with an enormous stone lion. Bartoldi's stone lion is seated but alert and aggressive, as though it's ready to defend the castle under which the work was eventually placed. There is no inscription on this monument. There's, there's really nothing to it more than just a figure of a stone lion on a stone base. The work would probably be overlooked today, except for the fact of its enormous size. This seated lion is 11 meters high, or about 36 feet high, and it's twice as long as that. 36 feet high, that's that's like three of Michelangelo's Davids stacked one on top of the other. The Lion of Belfort, as the work is known, is absolutely enormous and indeed strongly invokes the colossal statuary one would find in Egypt. I mean, it could be a close cousin of the famous Sphinx. And it's actually built in the same way as the Sphinx. It's made out of blocks of sandstone that were carved and then assembled on site. Despite initial skepticism over Bartoli's ability to see the work through, arising from the comparative novelty of its construction, as well as its scale, the work was unveiled in 1880, after Bartoli had spent more than five years on the initial models for the work. Now, five years is sort of a long time uh, in which just to make a model for a lion, but we have to realize the difficulty in arriving at a model large enough to be used to create the final work. Let me explain. You see, if you're making a sculpture 36 feet high, what you don't want to do is enlarge it from a model that's only three and a half feet high. Small mistakes become big mistakes when you enlarge by more than 300% or so. So Bartoldi had to go through several enlargements to finally arrive at the final scale. First, he would create the original model in clay and then enlarge that to a larger scale, fixing the mistakes on that larger model and filling in the gaps in rendering that the smaller model couldn't capture, and then he would have to enlarge the whole work yet again. As the scale grows, so does the complexity of everything involved with the process, from the armature to dealing with the weight of these enormous clay models, to the complexity of casting on a large scale. His final small-scale model arrived at about one-third of the final scale, so it was about 12 feet high and 24 feet long. And a plaster cast of this so-called small-scale model was actually exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1878. It was well-received and subsequently bought by the government, and a beaten copper replica of the Lion of Belfort was made from this one-third scale model, and this copper statue now stands in Place d'Enfer in Paris. Now, seeing this work in Paris, 12 feet high and 24 feet long, it's difficult to imagine that there exists a version of it three times its size. But if you are ever near Belfort, France, it's definitely worth a side trip to see the colossal sandstone version. At night, it's beautifully lit and dominates an otherwise provincial cityscape. But we are getting ahead of ourselves here. The line of Belfort was completed in 1880, but let's go back to the year 1871, soon after the end of the Franco-Prussian War, and right at the time Bartoli was awarded the commission for the line of Belfort, although he hadn't started working on that project yet. 1871 was also just two years after his proposal for the Suez Canal had been rejected. But that project, or at least a project of that nature, had never left his mind. The disruptions in Paris were still reverberating through the city and the nation of France, and so Bartoli decided to seek work opportunities elsewhere. He approached his mentor, the famous writer and lover of America, Edward Laboulaye, and reminded him of the idea of a gift to the United States he had proposed years before. And he discussed with Laboulaye the prospect of sailing to America in order to maybe drum up some interest in the Monument to Liberty. Laboulaye provided Bartoli with dozens of letters of introduction to his numerous American correspondents, which included President Ulysses Grant. But at the same time, Laboulaye felt that it would be difficult to convince the nation of France to pay for such a monument in the near future as the very question of what sort of government would be in power still remained. But an exploratory visit and an introduction to America couldn't hurt, and so Frederick August Bartholdi sailed for the United States. And we'll hear what was to become of this visit to America, as if we don't already know, when the sculptor's funeral continues. <laughs> ¶¶ 
Hey guys. So here's the part in the podcast where I tell you about my latest workshops and learning opportunities that I have on offer. But here's the thing. Once this podcast hits the internet, it's there to stay. And so many of you listening now are listening in a far off future that I can only imagine with your jetpacks and your flying cars and your emperor for life, Donald Trump. You people of the future don't need to hear about my so-called upcoming workshops that, in your reality, are but a faded memory. So, what I'm going to do instead is tell all of you, present and future listeners, that you can always find out the latest workshops on offer at our website, thesculptorsfuneral.com. The Sculptor's Funeral, all one word, no apostrophe, dot com. Click on the link you find at the top of the page called Jason's Workshops. And there you will find all the latest and not out of date info on upcoming classes, lectures, tours, and everything else that happens around the world several times a year. Some are in Italy, some in the United States, some in the UK, and others in far off places, ones that are perhaps close to you. Nothing cures your post apocalyptic dystopian blues like a sculpture workshop, so why don't you come join me, or join my future AI cyborg, which will eventually replace me, at a sculpture workshop in your near future. Okay, so in 1871, as Frederick Bartholdi made his Atlantic crossing, he had quite a few things on his mind. Colossal statuary, such as the one he designed for the entrance of the Suez Canal, and also the recent turmoil in Paris with revolutionary forces clashing with governmental forces. In addition, Bartholdi was thinking about the fact that in five years, the United States would be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And part of the celebration included hosting an international exposition, as World's Fairs were then called. And finally, Bartholdi was mulling the idea of a gift of France to the United States, celebrating their alliance and shared ideals of freedom and democracy. Now, with all these ideas percolating in the same head, it's easy to see exactly how the idea of the Statue of Liberty arose. Laboulaye's proposal of a gift provided the reason for the statue, the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia would provide the occasion, and the sculptor himself, with his interest in colossal statuary, provided the form the statue would take. By the time Bartoli's boat had entered New York Harbor, the only questions about this project in his mind were who would pay for it and where it should go. And the second of these questions, Bartoli answered for himself before he ever got off the boat. His vessel, upon entering New York Harbor, passed by a small island called Bedloe's Island, which had served various purposes throughout the years, most recently as a defensive fort during the Civil War. The idea of placing the statue on Bedloe's Island, a statue similar to the one he had designed to serve as a lighthouse at the entrance of the Suez Canal, seemed perfect. This statue, too, could ostensibly serve as a lighthouse, but also as a symbol of the ideals Laboulaye had desired to express, the ideal of the United States as a beacon of freedom and manifestation of Enlightenment ideals. He even already thought of a name for a statue, and although we commonly call the statue the Statue of Liberty, its actual name is Liberty Enlightening the World. After arriving in the United States, Bartoli made good use of his letters of introduction from Laboulaye, meeting with President Grant, who offhandedly told him, yeah, sure, Bedloe's Island could probably be the host for this statue with little problem. He met with Charles Sumner in Washington, D.C. He met with politicians, merchants, and members of the press in Philadelphia, where the World's Fair was to be held in five years' time. He went to Boston, and he met the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and became friends with the painter John Lafarge and the architect Richard Morris Hunt. You might remember those two names, Lafarge and Hunt, from the podcast episodes on Augustus St. Gaudens. Lafarge and Hunt were involved with the building of Trinity Church in Boston, and in particular, you may remember that Richard Morris Hunt was the first American to attend the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris, where he studied architecture. Now, many of these connections would prove very useful to Bartholdi later on, both in connection with the Statue of Liberty and in getting other smaller commissions, obviously smaller commissions, in the United States. Almost everywhere Bartoli went in the United States, he was welcomed by the local literati, which were largely Francophiles, and saw Bartoli's proposal as a very interesting idea. Bartoli also got to know America and Americans well beyond the parlors of the New England elite. He traveled west all the way to California on the newly completed Transcontinental Railroad. 
Anyway, long story short, everyone he met was generally positive in regards to his idea, especially the part where it was to be a gift from France that the U.S. didn't have to pay for. Some people he met were mildly cautious, voicing concerns that ooh, America might be obligated to somehow return the favor. Bartoldi was a bit taken aback that his idea wasn't received more enthusiastically. I mean, generally, people were okay with it as long as it didn't involve any effort or obligation on the part of America. Now, back in France, after his visit, Bartoldi spent the next three years making small models of his idea, slowly perfecting the pose, composition, and attributes, which I'll talk about a little bit later. He was also busy getting started on his line of Belfort and a few other smaller commissions, as well as spending a lot of time figuring out how in the world to build a colossal statue. Bartoldi's plans called for the eventual Statue of Liberty to be about 150 feet high. How do you go about making that? Well, we know, most of us at least, know that the statue was made in copper, beaten copper, but how is that done? Well, the technique is called repoussé. It's one of the oldest forms of metalworking there is. It's simply taking a sheet of metal and striking it from the back side in order to form projections on the front side. You can either just go for it with your hammers and create your design by eye, or what you can do is first create a model of your work, then make a rigid mold, or negative, of your model, and then beat the copper into the mold so that the copper takes the form of the interior of the mold, just like wet plaster does. Sculpture has been produced by repoussé for millennia, but usually it's done for relief work or decorative arts and jewelry, and certainly it's usually done smaller. But people eventually found that it's also an economical way to make a lightweight dome, to use beaten copper rather than build a masonry dome. In 19th century France, sculptors had started experimenting with creating beaten copper statuary for the same reasons architects started using the technique for copper domes, for its economy and for its light weight. Statues in beaten copper, 12 feet tall, had just recently been added to the roof of Notre Dame Cathedral, for instance. And, in a more relevant example, just as Bartoli was beginning to get to work on enlarging his statue, a colossal beaten copper figure in Germany was getting its finishing touches. Known as the Hermann Denksmal, it's a statue which commemorates the legendary father of the German people, Arminius, standing 82 feet high. It's made of beaten copper, supported by an iron framework. Apparently, beaten copper statuary was an idea whose time had come, as new technology, like steel frameworks and mass production of sheet metal, could now allow ambitious sculptors like Ernst von Bandel, the sculptor of the Hermann Banksmal, as well as Bartoldi, to create sculpture at a scale not seen since antiquity. Finally, in 1875, Laboulaye, who now held an official post in the French government, felt that the political climate had settled down enough in France to the point where he and Bartoldi could go public with their idea of a gift to the United States. Interest in the Centennial Exhibition, or the 1876 World's Fair, had been growing in France, and they sought to capitalize on that interest. Laboulaye established a fundraising organization called the Franco-American Union, which publicized throughout France the intentions of the project and what the statue was meant to represent. At the same time, the Franco-American Union publicized the project in the American press and established itself there to raise money from the American public to pay for the pedestal of the statue. So the gift of the Statue of Liberty really was a joint collaboration. France made the statue, and America provided the pedestal, as well as the real estate for the work to stand on. Various fundraising parties and banquets were thrown, and at the outset, the project was favorably received by the general public on both sides of the ocean. Donations started to roll in, and when the money started to flow, Bartoldi could finally get to work. Now, how does one go about making a statue 150 feet high? Well, you we know the statue was to be made and beaten copper, as we mentioned, but how is that done? So to create a sculpture in the round, in repoussé, like the Statue of Liberty, you do it by beating the metal into a rigid mold, as I mentioned. But you do it in sections, rather than working with a single sheet, as you might with a relief. Now these sections are then riveted together to form the statue. Sounds easy enough, right? Now all you have to do is to make a model of your statue, make a piece mold of that model, and then go to town with your hammers. Of course, we're talking about a statue 150 feet tall. So Bartoldi takes his initial model, which was in terracotta, 
and stood about four feet high, and he enlarges it twice. The first time he enlarges it to 200% scale, and then he enlarges that second model four times larger than that. So he ends up with a statue in clay over 30 feet high. He makes his alterations and refinements, as is usual when enlarging to such a scale, and then he casts this work into plaster. Then, this 30-foot-tall plaster cast is marked with a pencil, dividing the work into over 300 separate sections. And then each of these 300 sections were enlarged by about 400% separately, one at a time. These 300 enlarged sections were modeled directly into plaster over a wooden structural support, and each were finished by Bartoli's own hand. So the final, full-scale model was never a single 150-foot statue from which they made a mold. No, it was made of 300 huge bits and pieces. And the repoussé molds were then made, again, in pieces from those 300 sections. And interestingly, the molds themselves were made out of wood rather than plaster. Remember, the, the molds here had to be stronger than the force you were applying to it with a hammer, right? You can't make it out of uh, plaster. You know, you try to beat a piece of copper, you know, a big, big sheet of copper into plaster, you're going you're gonna to break the plaster. And so they were made out of wood. And how they did it, they cut planks to precisely follow the contours of each form, of each of these sections, at regular cross sections, at regular intervals. It's kind of hard to explain, <laughs> but you can check out some images of these molds online at the image gallery page for the sculptorsfuneral.com, and it's a lot easier to understand once you're looking at what I'm talking about. But anyway, so once the basic shape of the copper plate was formed into these wooden molds, the copper was then moved into another mold, identical to the first mold, but this mold was now made out of lead, backed by plaster. Now this mold was the one used to hammer in the finer details because less force was needed you know, to make these finer details, and so a lead and plaster mold could be strong enough to be used for this part of the work. So just to recap, the repoussé process involved two molds, one for the rough form and made of wood, and then one for the details made in lead and plaster. Now the copper sheeting that was used for the Statue of Liberty was actually very thin, especially considering the scale of the work. It's only about two and a half millimeters thick, about the thickness of an American penny. So obviously, a statue this thin, but 150 feet tall, placed on a windy coastline, would need to have a very solidly designed interior structure to support it. A sculpture like this had never been attempted on such a scale, and even works that came close to it in scale, like the Hermann Danksmal, were sighted in much more favorable weather conditions, protected from coastal winds and from the corrosive effects of salt water. So, Bartoldi enlisted the help of one of the most prominent architects of the day in France, his old architecture teacher, Violette Leduc. Apart from being a prominent practicing architect, Violette Leduc was also a progressive theorist, both interested in historical architecture and yet critical of the conservative tastes still holding sway in architecture of his time. His solution for supporting a colossal copper statue was pretty innovative. Leduc proposed constructing a central masonry pillar, which would support the weight of the copper statue and also provide an immovable bulk to the interior of the statue. Then, over this masonry pillar would be placed an interior copper form, sort of like an inner shell to the statue, and it roughly followed the contours and the shape of the statue, just smaller. And then over this inner copper shell, the outer copper shell, that is, the copper statue itself, would then be placed. The gap in between the inner and outer shells would then be filled, partially, with sand. The sand would be there to provide rigidity and weight to the statue, countering the forces of wind and weather. And the sand filling would only go up to a certain height, and then steel supports would strengthen the statue's head and raised arm. So starting work on the statue, as they did in 1875, meant that it certainly would not be complete in time for the World's Fair in Philadelphia in 1876. However, the World's Fair was an excellent opportunity to raise interest and funding for the statue. So the first thing Bartoli did was to start the full-scale raised arm, complete with the Torch of Liberty, and was able to finish it and to ship it to America in time for the World's Fair. 
It stayed in the U.S. on display for several years, placed at New York's Madison Square Park. Meanwhile, work continued in Paris on the rest of the statue, and as luck would have it, France itself was hosting a World's Fair in 1878, and Bartoli had finished the head and shoulders of the Statue of Liberty in time to have the colossal bust on display there. Now, the PR generated from these two World's Fairs was absolutely crucial to the success of the project. Not only were funds raised by private donations to the project, but also by licensing the image of the Statue of Liberty for merchandising purposes. The two World's Fairs had made the Liberty Statue very well known, and its image was used to sell everything from soap to life insurance, and this was an important revenue stream to fund the project. On top of that, small-scale reproductions of the statue, just like the ones you can still buy today, were sold as well. Bartoli even sold entry tickets to his enormous workshop in Paris where the statue was being built and assembled. They even held a national lottery to raise funds. And in this way, the Statue of Liberty was eventually paid for in bits and pieces and however it could be used to make a little money. All these efforts meant that the work on the statue continued uninterrupted, but construction did receive a big setback when, in 1879, the architect Violet Leduc unexpectedly died. His innovative ideas for supporting the statue hadn't yet been tested, and there were too many unanswered questions as to exactly how it should be done, and so Bartoli had no choice but to find another architect to engineer the support structure of the statue. Fortunately, a rising star in the world of architecture and engineering, Gustave Eiffel, was available. Eiffel, up to this point, had a successful career designing rail bridges and other structures using steel and iron infrastructure, a relatively new advancement in architecture that allowed for buildings to grow ever taller and more dynamic in ways traditional masonry architecture could never manage. Of course, today we remember Gustave Eiffel for the Tour d'Eiffel, or the Eiffel Tower a structure built for the 1889 Paris World's Fair, less than a decade after completing the interior structure of Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty. The lessons learned and the techniques developed for the Statue of Liberty were like a dry run for Gustave Eiffel, and it's possible that the Eiffel Tower would not have been built as tall as it was were it not for that previous experience. The upshot of getting rid of the original idea of filling the Statue of Liberty partially with sand and, and using an inner shell, meant that the statue could be completely preassembled in Paris, allowing for modifications in structure and test fitting the entire work together to make sure that the final installation would go off without a hitch. Construction of the internal support began in 1881, and slowly the full-size beaten copper sheets were assembled one at a time over the next three years. On the 4th of July in 1884, a ceremony officially marked both the completion of the statue and its handover to the ambassador from the United States, accepting the gift on behalf of his nation. Soon after, the Statue of Liberty was slowly dismantled, piece by piece, and prepared for shipping to the United States. But remember, the copper statue itself was just one end of the deal. The Franco-American Committee also had to raise funds for the pedestal, which was to be built in America on Bedloe's Island, and this was to be paid for by fundraising in the U.S. But it wasn't going so well. The architect chosen for the pedestal was Richard Morris Hunt, who Bartoli had met, and who had become one of the leading, if not the leading, American architect of his time. Now, the pedestal, of course, was much simpler and less expensive to construct than the statue, but... Hunt wasn't even selected to design it until 1881, at a time when the statue in Paris was well underway. And by the time Hunt's ideas for the pedestal were approved in 1884, the statue was already complete. Now, there were a lot of reasons for the delay in construction of the pedestal, and they can all be summed up pretty much by the phrase American skepticism. Many Americans thought the colossal work would never be completed. Many others didn't understand why the French were doing it in the first place, why such a grand gesture was being made like this by the French. Some people thought it strange or even rude that, in order to accept this so-called gift, Americans would have to pay for its pedestal. I mean, why couldn't the French just give the statue a pedestal themselves if they were so eager to make such a grand gesture? There were also objections to the style of the statue itself. An allegorical statue in neoclassical trappings just seemed too French and not American enough. 
American sculpture of the time had moved on from neoclassicism to much more naturalistic work and with uniquely American themes. There was a growing sense that American art was finally evolving from its European origins, and a statue such as this could even be a cultural setback to that progress. It's difficult to imagine anyone making these arguments about the Statue of Liberty now, of course, as iconic as it has become for the United States, but at first, people were generally distrustful of the whole enterprise. The Franco-American Committee eventually appealed to Congress to raise the funds for the pedestal, but even this ran into major opposition, mostly from Western states, that saw the statue as something for New York and not for the nation. Western states could see no value in spending money to decorate an island off the coast of New England with a big French statue. So the Franco-American Committee tried in the U.S. what had worked in France. Fundraising dinners, branding licenses for the image of the statue, the sale of souvenir replicas, and so on. The committee did what it could to keep the project and the image of the statue in the papers and in the minds of the American public, and gradually that public grew familiar with it and started to show a little more enthusiasm for the project. By 1883, there was enough money to start preparing the site and pouring the foundation for the pedestal. But by 1885, the committee ran entirely out of money, just as the pedestal itself was in the beginning stages of construction. The committee publicly announced in the papers that the project was coming to a halt, and then pleaded with the public to spare itself from the humiliation of not being able to accept the gift from the French people. Three days after the announcement by the Franco-American Committee that the work was being put to a halt, a strong supporter of the monument, and himself an immigrant to America, hit upon a possible solution. Joseph Pulitzer, the newspaper man who would later give his name to the Pulitzer Prize for Excellence in Journalism, announced in his flagship publication, The New York World, that the newspaper would run its own independent subscription campaign to raise the remaining funds for the statue. And he had a very simple and very smart plan. He pledged that the full name of every donor who gave, in any amount, even if they only gave a penny, would be published in the pages of the New York World. And this appeal to the vanity of the average American was all it took. Within five months, Pulitzer had raised the remaining needed funds from over 120,000 different donations, most of which were in amounts under a dollar. But even before the fundraising was done, 120 wooden crates filled with 150 tons of copper and steel, had arrived at Bedloe's Island. The pedestal was completed in the spring of 1886, and the statue was re-erected piece by piece. By October of 1886, the statue was complete. The inauguration was a huge celebration involving parades and speeches and everything you might imagine. What started as a suggestion made at a dinner party 21 years before had culminated in one of the most iconic works of art in history. And so there we have it, the story of how and why the Statue of Liberty stands in New York Harbor. It really just is a bare-bones retelling, though. I could have easily made this a two-part podcast, as there is just so much fascinating information out there on it, not just the history of its creation, but also of the relevance it's had in the consciousness of the nation since then, as well as the history of its modifications and restorations, which might sound kind of boring, but it's actually a pretty interesting story. Now, if you want the fuller story, I suggest you just go to YouTube and watch any of the dozens of videos there centered on the statue and its creator, its history, and so forth. Or, for the best and fullest account that I've come across, read the book called Enlightening the World, The Creation of the Statue of Liberty by Yasmin Khan. It's fantastic. But wait, we're not done here yet. Let's go over the statue in detail and talk about its symbolism, its sources, and its expression. So really, it's hardly necessary to tell you what the Statue of Liberty looks like. We all know it. It's a woman in a toga, spiky crown on her head, a tablet in one arm, and a torch held aloft in another. But in order to understand why the Statue of Liberty looks like it does, we need to talk a bit about the statue's distant relative, the Colossus of Rhodes. The Colossus of Rhodes is really the only statue that can be thought of as the Statue of Liberty's precedent. It was built by the city-state of Rhodes in present-day Greece way back in 280 B.C. to commemorate the island nation's victory over Cyprus. 
It was placed either on a pedestal in the harbor of Rhodes or just on shore. No one's really sure exactly where. But either way, it's very much like how the Statue of Liberty stands in the New York Harbor. The statue stood just over 100 feet tall, or about 33 meters, and it was a statue of Rhodes' patron god, the god of the sun, Helios. The statue only stood for about half a century before it was broken off at the knees by an earthquake. But the statue lay on the ground, fairly intact, for another 800 years. It was written about extensively by ancient Greek and Roman historians, and so we actually know quite a bit about it. And it's regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, right up there with the Great Pyramids and the Lighthouse at Alexandria. Now, for his Statue of Liberty, Bartoldi took several cues from the Colossus of Rhodes in order to link his statue with the Colossus and imply that his statue is a wonder of the modern world. First off, the Statue of Liberty is actually the same scale as the Colossus of Rhodes. Now, the Statue of Liberty is 151 feet high, but that's with her upraised arm and her torch, right? So from head to toe, she's about 100 feet tall, right around the same size as the Colossus of Rhodes. Another, more direct reference to the Colossus comes from the form of the headdress that Liberty is wearing. As we all know, she's wearing a crown with seven spikes emanating from it like rays of the sun. Now, many descriptions of the Colossus of Rhodes has the sun god Helios wearing something similar. But why give an allegory of liberty the attribute of a sun god? Well, remember that the real name of the statue is Liberty Enlightening the World. Bartoldi was playing with the metaphorical nature of this statue as a beacon of liberty with the obvious symbols of the torch, but also with liberty's crown. Bartholdi's statue is, of course, far from the only allegorical figure of liberty ever created, but it is notable for its rejection of much more prevalent iconography for the allegory of liberty. Now, generally, allegories of liberty, whether painted or sculpted, wear a certain type of headpiece of a very particular type. It's known as a Phrygian cap, or more commonly called a liberty cap. It's sort of a sort of a soft, floppy hat with no brim. It looks a bit like a modern-day knit stocking cap. It was worn in ancient times to identify freed slaves, and it has been used in art since then to represent the idea of the pursuit of freedom. Bartoli's Liberty does not have this cap, and it was a glaring and unforgivable omission to some people when Bartoli first made his design public. Actually, Bartoldi's early designs did have Liberty wearing the Phrygian cap, but because Bartoldi wanted to make windows in that cap, both for looking out of and for illumination, he went instead with a crown with rays of the sun. It just worked better in his design, and the obvious tie to the Colossus of Rhodes didn't hurt. Another tip of the hat to antiquity comes in the form of the pedestal designed by Richard Morris Hunt. The classically inspired architecture of this pedestal isn't just any old classical architecture. It takes its form, proportion, and decoration directly from another of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. Now, at Alexandria, a city on the coast of Egypt, there's a small island in the harbor on which this lighthouse stood, almost identical in position to Bedloe's Island's position in New York Harbor. The lighthouse was one of the tallest structures in the world when it was built in the 3rd century BC, around 350 feet tall, and it became the prototype for all subsequent lighthouses. It was also destroyed by earthquakes, eventually, but it did last until about the 15th century. Of course, the Lighthouse of Alexandria is an obvious choice of design for the statue's pedestal, a statue imbued with ideas of illumination and enlightenment. Now, the large tablet in Liberty's hand is often mistaken for a book, but it's a tablet, and tablets have their own symbolic message. Tablets, as distinct from books, carry commandments, like Moses' Ten Commandments, or they carry laws, like the Code of Hammurabi. On Liberty's tablet is a simple inscription, July 4th, 1776, the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So here we see the tablet representing law. Now combine this law motif with the symbol held in her other hand, the torch, the torch of liberty, and we see that this particular allegory of liberty leads with light and law. 
Now, this is an important choice Bartoli made here. Other very common depictions of liberty include instruments of war and revolution, like swords and banners. Coming as it did soon after the American Civil War, Bartoli did well to make his liberty a symbol of comfort and peace. There is one more symbolic element to this work of which relatively few people are aware. This takes the form of a broken chain being trampled under the foot of liberty. Broken chains are not an uncommon motif for liberty, but they're usually held in liberty's hand. Well, as both of her hands are already occupied, placing the chains underfoot was the next best choice, or perhaps even the best choice, as the image of liberty trampling chains underfoot had recently been depicted in a popular portrait of Abraham Lincoln. This allusion to the emancipation of the slaves in America makes this allegory of liberty, though sculpted by a Frenchman, indelibly American. Now lastly, we come to the inscription on the pedestal. It wasn't included in Bartoli's original design and in fact was only added to the pedestal in 1903. The inscription is a poem, it's a sonnet, written by the poet Emma Lazarus. And this poem is crucial to the contemporary understanding of the meaning of the Statue of Liberty. First and foremost, Americans and the rest of the world today understand the Statue of Liberty to be a welcoming beacon to immigrants seeking a better life in the New World. But as we now know, this was not the original intent. So how did a statue designed to commemorate the anniversary of a revolution and emphasizing Enlightenment values come to be synonymous with the idea of America as a global refuge. Well, if the writer Edward Labelle was the mind behind the Statue of Liberty, and Auguste Bartoldi gave the idea of physical form, then Emma Lazarus gave the statue its soul. Lazarus was an activist as well as a poet, working on the behalf of recent immigrants to the United States, many of whom had arrived penniless and without educations. She saw the Statue of Liberty as an affirmation of the promise the United States held for people around the world. And when, as part of the fundraising effort for the statue, she was asked to write a poem, she wrote a sonnet entitled The New Colossus. I recited a little bit of it at the beginning of the episode, you know, the famous part, but now I'm going to read you the whole thing. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I think it's very important to know the full poem. Lazarus's sonnet is a poem of comparison between the Statue of Liberty and the Colossus of Rhodes. One was built to celebrate military victory and conquest. The other to celebrate the liberation of peoples in a land of refuge. The Statue of Liberty, Mother of Exiles, is really like no other sculpture. It's been relegated to the status of tourist attraction for many decades now. And for many Americans, it's little more than just a symbol of a vague, generalized patriotism. As a culture, we've largely forgotten the more specific meanings behind the Statue of Liberty. And really, no work of art has helped to shape a cultural identity and a specific cultural ideal as this one did. And I can't end this podcast without remarking that it seems to me that we've moved on to another phase recently in America, and many Americans, the same Americans who would proudly wear the image of Lady Liberty on their ball caps and whose ancestors may well have cried tears of joy as they sailed into New York Harbor, would likely actively repudiate the very ideals the statue was made to represent. While it's true that America has never fully lived up to its idealistic pretensions, those among us who wish to make America great again might start by taking a good hard look at the meaning of American greatness as expressed by the Statue of Liberty. Well, I want to thank you all again for listening. 
Don't forget to check out additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral YouTube channel or on our Facebook group page as well. And while you're there, you can join in the conversation. You can also subscribe to the podcast at Stitcher Mobile or iTunes, or you could subscribe from any service from which you get your podcasts, and you can receive those podcasts automatically on your PC, tablet, or mobile device every week. And if you want to help the podcast reach other people just like yourself, leave a review of the podcast or give the podcast a rating at iTunes or wherever you subscribe. Check out the SculptorsFuneral.com website where you can stream the complete archives of the show. You can check out the image galleries for this and for every other episode. You can find out about upcoming workshops, and it's also where you can pick up a Sculptor's Funeral mug or tote bag. And finally, if you happen to need to stock your studio with supplies and materials, you can click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, at thesculptorsfuneral.com. Clicking on the link and buying from Blick helps to support the podcast, and for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.